listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper. And remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And I got to tell you something, people. You know, I'm a big 80s fan. I love the 80s music and the 80s movies. And, you know, there was a movie in 1985 called Weird Science. And at the end, Gary and Wyatt are driving their cars to see the girls they like. And the song that was playing was Tenderness by General Public. And my guest today sang that song. And what I like about that song is, you know, I got married. It'll be two years in September. That song, we played that at my wedding. And we also played his other band, the English Beat. We played Save It For Later at our wedding because I knew that DJ was going to play some good tunes and all my friends love the 80s. And my guest is Dave Wakeling. How you doing, Dave? What a pleasure and congratulations. Thank you. You know, it was funny when we were putting the, the wedding song list together, I was sitting there going, you know, all the different songs for the DJ. That tenderness, I, as I saw, I still remember the first time I think I heard that was in Weird Science. And it was just such the... You, you knew that people were going to get up and dance. And now I'm 57. At the time, I was 55. So it's a bunch of 50-year-old people. You know, you know, you want them to dance, but you don't want them to overexert themselves. Right. But that's a song that you overexert yourself. And, and the younger kids who were there, like nieces and nephews, were like, holy shit, what's this song? And they came out and they started dancing. It's oh, lovely. I, I got to uh, spend a day on the set of Weird Science, uh, when Kelly LeBrock was uh, filming her bits, and um, I'd known her in London before she'd started doing films and all. She was a model, and uh, so it was very exciting. I got to sit there, and then she'd go out and do a bit, and I would stand behind the camera and watch her filming her bits with John coaching her this way and that way. It was really interesting to see. Now, i got to ask you, I, I know you guys are going to start going on tour soon. How has it been you for the last year not performing? Because you've been performing for a long time. You're used to that lifestyle. How have you spent this last year in, in shutdown? Well, it's been quite good because for many years I've needed a good rest and a good sleep. And I hadn't had one. Uh, I just kept touring uh, about 150, 170 shows a year. Uh, so, although it was a shock to start with, after a couple of months, I thought, gosh, I feel so different. What's happening? And I was like, oh, it's because you're getting square meals and stability and sleep and that sort of thing. So that was quite good. Um, and I, th I threw myself into my gardening a bit. So my garden is resplendent at the moment. I'm a rose fancier. Now, when you're, are you having red roses or having different color roses? What does your garden look like? What, what else is in it besides roses? I want to hear about your garden. Well, I post it on Facebook every Sunday, Scardening Sunday, it's called, um, on the English Beat page from the uh, Wakeling Rose Gardens. Uh, I like David Austin roses, and I've got quite a lot of them, some red ones, some white ones, some pink ones, some yellow and gold ones. And they were all mixed up last year. But it was starting, I thought, to look a bit too fiesta and unfocused. So I separated them out over the winter, and I've got all the red ones against one wall, trained upwards, and they're just, I'm looking at them now, they've created a lovely uh, wall. Um, and the other ones I've put with complementary colours, so all the yellow and gold ones have got purple and blue flowers around them, salvias, um, Plumbago, that sort of thing. Uh, and then I've got one section that is whites and pinks with pastels, which was my go at an English cottage garden. You're kind of limited in as much as you can only really have what can tolerate 120 degrees in August. <laughs> so some of the more tender plants have to go hiding for the summer just to survive it, you know, so it's, it's not quite as easy. But it's great fun for me. I really enjoy it. Uh, and it's not much work at the moment, just a bit of deadheading and a bit of sweeping up. Most of the work's in the winter, the pruning and the feeding and getting everything ready. And now it's kind of a chance to sit back and enjoy it till midsummer when the first set of roses will drop off and then you feed them again, prune them a bit and should get a second showing. Now, how, do you, how are you going to prepare it? to go on tour because I know you're going to England you have a lot of dates 
you have a lot, I mean, I look at you have a lot of dates and you're, like you said, you've got good sleep and, you know, you're probably used to it, like, oh, I'm sleeping in my own bed. Oh, yeah. I can wake up and drink some grapefruit juice, you know, but yeah. then you go on the road and it's, you're working and you're getting done. How do you prepare yourself for that? I mean, I know you've toured so much in your life, yeah. but as we get older, our bodies change and, and we need more sleep. How are you going to prepare for this upcoming tour? Well, I'm doing a bit more swimming now that the, the it's warmed up a bit. I've got a pool in the garden, being in the valley. Uh, so I'm swimming a bit more, and that's starting to work. First few tries out, I was so tired after 10 or 15 minutes, I'd have to go and lie down. My whole <laughs> body was aching like I'd been training for hours when I was a kid. That heavy, dull feeling in your arms and legs. But it's getting a bit better now, and that should help, because it helps to get your breathing going. Too. Uh, and I've got a the walking machine thing that I do a few minutes on and a Pilates machine that I was doing on and I've kind of slacked off. So I've got to try and get back into that a bit more. Um, but we are a bit concerned because the news out the UK these last few days is not great. Um, they have a number of cities where the cases are going up. The Indian variants, as it's called, has uh, started to double every seven days cases and what's most concerning is that people with one shot of vaccine are being hospitalized from it even one guy with two shots of vaccine but he was quite old and frail they say but it does seem eminently more transmissible and they're not really sure whether it's as uh, virulent or not now, they think that the um, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, the one they're using in England, uh, might be 10 or 15% less effective on this new variant to make it 60 or 70%. And uh, most of England, or 30% of England have had one shot. So they may not even be 50% protected by this thing. Uh, they they're meant to make a decision June the 14th, but uh, the decisions that they've just started making about this uh, immediate relaxing. Uh, they, they're sending all sorts of warning signals and uh, government ministers are fighting over it and leaking about it. Uh, I don't know what the truth of it is, but the stories out of 10 Downing Street is that it's an argument about if they open, will the hospitals become overrun or will the hospitals be able to cope with the massive surge of cases? And if it, can, if it can cope with the massive surge of cases, in their opinion, then for business reasons, they'd like to open it up. Well, I, hopefully you'll, everything will be safe and you'll get the tour because you have such great music. What got you into music? I mean, the one thing about the English beat is, for us, us kids over here in America, it was just a different sound. And there's so many influences. But as a kid, were you from a musical family or how did you, how did you get into loving music? Not a particularly musical family. My dad liked Frank Sinatra and nobody else, really. Um, my first record was uh, one of those plastic orange record players with the thick plastic discs. Uh, my first single was Little Brown Jug. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Little Brown Jug, don't I love thee? Which I didn't realise was going to be the theme of my life for many years. <laughs> uh, and then... Uh, I was very, very involved in swimming as a kid. I used to go training two or three times a day and had my head shaved and went to swim meets at the weekends. And I won quite a lot of medals and national and state or equivalent. Uh, and on the way back home, if I'd won a medal, if I'd done good, there was a present for me in the back, in the trunk of the car. All, and when my dad stopped off at a pub to celebrate my victory, I would get an orange soda and I could have the radio on. If I didn't meddle, I would sit in the dark in the back of the car, <laughs> having been told that I would never know what my gift was going to would have been. And, um, and so when I won a medal and I had the radio on, music started to become more and more important to me. 
And there's it, it, it one specific moment that I remember where I realised the power of music, for me at least. I was already pretty emotional and chlorine in the eyes and kind of red eyed anyway. Uh, but the radio was on and it played uh, the four tops, Don't Walk Away, Renee, and then played uh, Rolling Stones, Ruby Tuesday. And I started kind of... <laughs> no, I've just got, just got chlorine in my eyes. But... <laughs> Walk away, walk away, Renee. But um, Ruby Tuesday finished me off, and I was just in floods. I wasn't really crying. There was just tears rolling down my face as I listened to the song. And still, I get that same feeling off both of those songs whenever I listen to them. It's exactly the same. It's almost as if I was in the back of the car, because the feeling is precise. I can remember it, and it resembles it entirely. So you fell for them, and they, they they touched you, and is that why you said, I want to be a musician, I want to touch people? Not really. That was just a dream to be in a group. You know, that was just a dream that, that sort of came true without me doing much about it, it would seem. Uh, no, I, I was wondering whether to be a firefighter or a Buddhist monk or work for Greenpeace. Those were the, those were the main things and actually I'd started saving up to go east and be a monk but when I did I started having lots of dreams about motorbikes and girls on motorbikes girls at the side of motorbikes me and a girl on a motorbike um, and it went on for a little while and I thought there the, the probably isn't much point going all the way to southern India or wherever to sit on an orange tail thinking about girls and motorbikes and uh, I'd got some songs I'd started, and Andy Cox, we were living on the Isle of Wight together, making solar panels for his brother-in-law. Um, it was kind of ahead of the game a little bit. And, uh, and the songs started to come together and were quite good. And people kept saying, oh, you, you should make a group, you should. Those songs are good, they'd like them. No, one thing led to another. We found a bass player and we moved back to Birmingham, found a drummer and started rehearsing. And it happened very quickly, really. We started rehearsing in the middle of 1978, I think, and started doing shows at the beginning of 1979. I'm not quite sure. Uh, yeah, in March 1979. And uh, then Jerry Dammers from the specials came to see us after we'd been done about six or seven shows, told us about Two Tone and this band called The Selector. And they had a show in two days' time in Blackpool. Would we like to be the opening band? And I said, yes. We didn't have a way of getting to Blackpool, but we sorted that out. And we met the specials there and we went down well in Blackpool. And they said, oh, the selector are playing in London on Saturday. Hope and Anchor, I think it was. Would you like to open for them? We said, yes. And then tried to see if we could borrow the van that we borrowed from Thursday. <laughs> and, uh, and so we did that one and we met the guys from Madness. And that was all very well and good. And uh, Jerry Danner said, would you like to make a single? And we said, yes. And so we made a single. And it came out in October on Two Tone, a double A side, Tears of a Clown, ranking full stop on the other side. And it went to number six in the charts by Christmas. And that was it. We were in a group. Why? What made you choose Tears from a Clown? Was there any certain reason or did you not want yeah. to do it? Yeah, well, there was a reason why we did the song. It was suggested by our drummer, Everest, because as we started playing the songs, we could hold them together for two or three minutes, then everybody would sort of drift off into their own style. And we had to try and keep pulling it back. We'd hold it for a little while, then it'd go off again. And some of it was frustrating. And Everett said, I know, he said, why don't we all rehearse and learn up a song by ourselves next week and try playing it next Tuesday, which was the rehearsal night. And um, he said, let's, let's play a song that we all know, and then we can try one of your weird ones, like that mirror thing. <laughs> <laughs> we were all from such different backgrounds, really. Me and Andy were about the same. We'd been a 
junior college together. David was a couple of years younger and just punk, really, at the time. Um, Roger hadn't joined the band yet, and Everett um, liked soul music. So it took us about 10 minutes to find a song that all of us knew, and Tears of a Clown was the first song that everybody, oh yeah, I know that one. It turned out when we played it, we only know, knew about half the chords, but we knew enough. Ding, 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 ding. Just keep it on the same note, sing over it. And so we learned that one, and we would play Tears of a Clown, then we'd play a weird one like Mirror. Tears of a Clown, Big Shot, Tears of a Clown, Click, Click, Tears of a Clown, Twist and Crawl, Tears of a Clown, Best Friend. So that we actually rehearsed Tears of a Clown way more than any other song. So when we had got eight songs ready... David Steele said, one gig is worth a thousand rehearsals. So we've got eight songs now, we should do a gig. So well, that's only half an hour's worth, isn't it? Well, we'll stick that Tears of a Clown in, that'll be 45 minutes if you talk in between. So we stuck it in the set and we're absolutely amazed how well it went down. And it did, you know, when you're starting, you take whatever gig you can get. So some are student union gigs, working men's clubs, reggae clubs, punk clubs, whatever you could get. And sometimes the reggae songs that go down the best, sometimes the punk songs that go down the best. But every time, Tears of a Clown just packed people onto the floor. And they really liked the, the up-tempo remake of it. So, Jerry Dam has asked us, would we like to make a single? And we said, yes. And then, it got a bit more record company-ish. And uh, Chrysalis said, well, whatever song you, songs you pick, uh, we have the rights on them for five years and you can't have them on your, your, your own record. Well, um, well we, we'd all presumed it would be Mirror in the Bathroom. That, we thought that was the flagship. Um, so we argued to and fro. We said, well, we're not giving you Mirror in the Bathroom and then we can't even have it on our own album and we haven't even made an album yet. That's ridiculous. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And eventually I said, I'll tell you what, you can have Tears of a Clown and you can argue with Smokey Robinson about whose bleeding song it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so they had to go with it. Now, as it turned out, it was probably better because they brought the song out the end of October, something like that, in October, 79. Uh, and the BBC, the top of the pops, and Radio 1, they kind of closed their playlist for the Christmas holidays for about four or five weeks so that you get to a certain point in the charts before Christmas, you'll get to stay on the charts over the Christmas holiday. And if you get a Christmas week or Christmas close top of the pops, then you're sure or fire that your song just gets stuck there on the playlist. And uh, we were lucky enough to do that. December 6th, I think it was, we got to go on top of the pops and the song just went straight up to number six. What is the experience of top of the pops? You know, I, I, I had a career, I was a stand up comedian for a while, and a lot of my friends, when they got the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, you know, and yeah. other friends, that solidified, you know, That's solidified. It. What was it like for you guys? Because you were a newer band, and to be on top of the pops is such a huge thing. What was it like that night that you guys were on it? Were you nervous? Were you excited? I mean, what was going through your heads? We were very nervous, but really excited because and we even discussed it. It was like, wow, we wanted to be in a group and we're already on top of the pop. So we, we could probably retire tonight after this. We're done. It was like, yep, made a group, got on top of the pops, next project. That was it really in England, even though it was very poppy and some of it was like Eurovision song contest -y. Even people who were into punk and all more modern genres, everybody stopped for Top of the Pops. It was quite odd. And uh, we got in the dressing room and somebody said, oh, there's a telegram for you. So opened it up, a card, and on the tape it said, uh, congratulations and very well done. All my best, Smokey Robinson, Joe Bear Music. I was like, we've got a telegram from Smokey Robinson. We were so excited. We were so happy. And it was only five years ago that the manager at the time told me, 
Oh, yeah, I organised that with my mate at Joe Beck Music. Smokey Robinson didn't know anything about it. We just wanted to cheer you up before the show. <laughs> Buggers. But I did get to meet Smokey Robinson, which was lovely, at a Grammys party in Los Angeles. Uh, I was introduced by Christopher Cross, who's tall, isn't he? Very tall. He's like as tall as a mast on a yacht. Ridiculous basketball at all. Anyway, he introduced us, and I told Smokey Robinson that he, when I was a kid, I thought his voice sounded like an angel, and that if and I could try and copy his voice, which I could as a kid. I said I thought if I could sing like you, I'd be an angel too. And he gave me the loveliest hug, and it went on. <laughs> And it went on. And Christopher Cross broke in like a referee. <laughs> <laughs> back. She gloves down. Box on. <laughs> so it was lovely, really fabulous to meet him. Splendid chap. Now, the, the writing in the early days, you know, when, when you were writing, because there were so many different influences, as you said, your music has a lot of different sounds. How would you guys have a writing session, you know, before Tears, when you first started, how would you guys write together? How would you sit there and say, okay, we're going to do this sort of ska or this sort of reggae or we're just going to mesh it? um, We didn't write very much at all in uh, tandem. It was usually somebody came up with an idea and there was mainly two choices. It was either a bass line from David Steele, which happened quite often especially at the beginning of the band, not so much at the end of the band. Or it was a, a three-chord, folky-sounding rendition of something that I'd written. Or Andy and me might come up with a guitar thing between us, and, and that would turn into a song. But I don't really remember any songs where we all sat down and said, let's write a song. It was people bringing things in and, people building on the top of that and then having ideas. Oh, what if you tried this? Or what if you did that? Uh, then we also had a, a kind of um, UN Security Council uh, situation where every anybody, everybody had the power of veto. So if four people liked something and one said it was vile, which David Steele would often use that word, then it wasn't done. We had to have a unanimous agreement on everything else. We wouldn't go ahead with this. It was quite odd. And we, we shared everything equally too. Uh, even for the first few months, everybody in the office, we all put ourselves on the same pay, uh, regardless. And uh, the drummer, Everett, said that he could hear that still in the music. He said, you can tell, compared to some other groups, he said, you can tell that we all thought we were in it together because we were. Whereas with some of the other groups in the two-tone family, after the royalty checks came in from the first album, some people were horrified to find out that other members of the band were extremely wealthy and they were still on the same as they had been. And and that really started the disassembling of some of the two-tone bands. Uh, with us, it went the other way because the money was the same, the cleverest and the laziest amongst us realised that we didn't really have to go to that rehearsal on Tuesday. So long as we went to the office to pick up the cheque on Thursday, it would be the same amount. So uh, it, it, it ended up a bit limousine liberalism or something, whatever you'd call it, uh, and, and it, it actually made us lazy. So that was an interesting lesson as a, you know, a budding young socialist at the time, uh, was that it, by making us equal, we'd actually taken away our incentive a little bit, which was a bit of a shock to me, but anyway, a lesson learned. Now, after Top of the Pops, what happened then? Then did you get a record deal? When did you get your first record deal? Was that And it was, was it because of Top of the Pops? Yes, I would say so, although it started a little bit before then. Um, The record companies had been very embarrassed by punk. They thought it was a load of rubbish. They can't even play their bloody instruments, you know. Um, 
And there was a new double live album from somebody else there. It's a concept album. <laughs> and they, they missed the punk bands and they tried to overcompensate afterwards. So is that really, if you'd got a room full of people dancing, they wanted to sign you. Just in case. And with Two Tone, when we brought out our single, the specials and Madness were both in the top ten on Two Tone records. And the selector was still in the top 30 with their single. So the way it was introduced, it's the hottest new label in years and two bands in the top 10 already. And here's the next great successful band, The Beat. <laughs> it's like, oh, thank you. <laughs> We're in. Some of our friends hated us for it. <laughs> <laughs> So we had loads of record companies and we found out what the specials had done to make two-tone on Chrysalis and we found out who their lawyer was and we had him take us on two, Ian Adam, and he created a, a record deal for us with GoFeet Records with much of the same um, uh, ideas. We could bring out singles from other bands and we could bring out one album a year from another band uh, that Arista had to pay for, and we didn't have to have their approval on it. Uh, it didn't work out as well. It, it, you, you can force somebody to bring out a record, but you can't force them to spend money on it and market it. <laughs> <laughs> right? So after the first week, they go, no, nah, not really. Just not, it's not, it's not clicking, Dave. It's not click. We tried to tell you. <laughs> so that didn't work as well as we'd hoped um, with the album we all had a favourite reggae album called Heart of the Congos by the Congos produced by Lee Perry really one of the classic reggae albums of the 70s and you could only get scratched copies I had two copies at the time because different tracks were scratched and so you'd have to switch them around depending on what track you wanted and uh, People hunted high and low around second-hand shops trying to find anybody got a copy of Heart of the Congos. I knew one person with an unscratched copy. And so we decided that should be the first album we brought out on the basis that we didn't know how long this pop group thing was going to last. But at the very least, we'd all have a box of Heart of the Congos albums to see us through, which we did. We got to remaster it with Bob Sargent. And even to this day, although it's gone through a number of different releases and pressings, I can tell they still use our mastering of it. They still actually use our artwork that we created for it. And then Cedric Mighton, the lead singer of the band, came to Birmingham, lived with us for a while, taught us how to cook Jamaican food, and then sang the high falsetto on the song Doors of Your Heart, and came and did a few shows with us in England. And I just got a CD of like the best of extended versions of Hearts of the Congos and in the back of the booklet there's one of them wearing a beat t-shirt <laughs> so that's it then full circle we're good we're good now when did uh, Roger join the band Roger came on stage about a couple of weeks before Jerry Dammers showed up he'd come to a couple before Tuesday nights there was a pub round the corner by the station called The Crown. And because they were by the station, they had all sorts of people coming in for a pint. And so they were a bit more tolerant than the other pubs, which often had like suit and tie regulations and stuff. So The Crown was the only pub that would let punks and rasters in. No punks, no rasters, a lot of the pubs. But the punk, The Crown would have any, anybody. So that became the Crown Punks, and they still have a Facebook site celebrating it. Uh, it's also the pub where like Black Sabbath did their first gig. It's quite a historical thing. They're thinking of turning it into a kind of uh, rock and roll hall of fame for Birmingham. Uh, so Roger would, would be down there with the Crown Punks. And on the Tuesday night, when we went on stage about 9 o'clock, maybe 8.30, whatever, he would show up first with half a dozen people, then up to about 20 people. And uh, at the time, he'd got bleached peroxide hair. And um, 
a ripped up Union Jack that he wore around him as a jacket and everybody knew him and all um, and after about the fourth time he visited he jumped on stage while we were doing an instrumental part and started toasting pointing at people in the crowd and telling them what had happened in town that week and see Mr. Herman over there and just really just talking about the crowd well then they loved it and it sounded nice it sounded really good and it gave me a break from the singing the only problem was he'd got a lot to say so it went on and on and on and on and you'd be like no 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 just give me a shout when you're ready first two mirror in the back <laughs> Toast over everything. So he did that for a few weeks. And uh, then he said he showed up uh, before the show, after Sanchez, but before the show. And he said, um, what about me joining the group then? I'm sorry, it was after a show. It was after a show. What about me joining this group then? And I said, yeah, I said, that could work, couldn't it? I said, um, you see that? And I pointed to the big bass cabinet. It's always the most cumbersome piece of gear, is this? The big speakers, isn't it? He said, yeah. I said, and you see that? And I pointed through the doors to our blue van. He said, yeah. I said, if you can get that in that, you can be in the group. So I already wanted him to be in the group anyway. We just wanted to watch him struggle with the bass cap. (laughs) I think it was the first and last time he ever moved any gear. (laughs) So he he got it in there. I said, right, well, then you're in the group. Then he said, one other thing. I said, what? He said, I haven't got anywhere to live. (laughs) Have you got anywhere I can live? I said, well, yes, I suppose you can live at my house if you want. I haven't got a bed, but you can sleep on the floor. I've got a heater. Great. (laughs) That was it. The star was born. Now, your first album does well in England. Now, when do you decide to come to America? What, does the record company send you? Because I know you guys came over here, right? The first time we came over, 1980, supporting the Pretenders. Um, we had been signed to Sire by an agreement via Arista. Arista had some sort of deal with Sire, where Sire had the first option on their signings. And and so they took us. But so we all... And we liked Sire very much. I mean, you'd got The Undertones, you got Talking Heads, Madness, you got all sorts of great stuff on there. But we didn't feel very comfortable or confident that we'd been kind of picked up by default. We hadn't anybody from Sire Records come to us and say, that's the best show I've seen in years. I want you to come and meet the people in the company, you know. So it felt a bit awkward, and frankly, it turned out a bit awkward. They didn't really do a great deal. Uh, even the pretenders were on the same label and we rarely saw them on the tour and it was a little bit dispiriting and then um, we, we could, just could not get any attention out of them and then the option came up and we called them and said you know the option's running out at the end of this week and we've not heard anything from you any of you and okay we'll get back to you and then we phoned again and then um seymour stein's secretary said he he wants you to know that he really loves the band but he's stuck at a kandinsky auction all week (laughs) and he'll get back to you next week and the option ran out on the friday and we signed with irs now what was it like when you came to america what was it did you enjoy the crowds or what did the crowds, how was your reaction from the crowds? Well, reggae was a bit of a new thing. Offbeat dancing was a bit of a new thing. Uh, whereas it was pretty familiar in England because we'd had lots of people from the Caribbean since the 50s and 60s. So we'd heard it. And it's been on the charts occasionally and it wasn't completely unfamiliar, but it was still a bit unfamiliar in America particularly amongst our audience, you know, white, young white pop fans or new wave fans. So it could be a bit off-putting. <laughs> there were a couple of times where somebody made a mistake and we'd rag them after the show. What the hell was that? I was watching somebody dancing and they put me off, okay? <laughs> so 
So we did have quite a bit of barn dancing. Left arm, left leg, right arm, right leg, left arm, left leg, right arm, left leg. We're like, don't watch, don't watch, don't watch. Uh, nowadays, of course, it's completely seamless, but it was a bit, it was a bit tricky at the time. Uh, but the crowds were really enthusiastic and they really liked it. And sometimes it took a minute for them to sing about, tell you about the songs because they really liked the idea of black and white people performing music on stage and looking like they were having a good time doing it. They really liked that part of it. We hadn't started it for that reason because in Birmingham, an industrial city where all sorts of different coloured people had stood next to each other working on car factory track lines and stuff. Pubs, there were plenty of pubs where there was black, white and Asian people. Uh, local pubs in Hansworth where black and white musicians would sit in on pickup sessions. So we didn't really think it was anything of it. The first time we noticed was when we went to London on that selector show. We met Madness. And we were sitting there in the corner and a bunch of really dodgy looking London skinheads came up and we're like, oh God, here we go. This is it. Here we go. And the guy says, uh, oh, black and white geezers play together. I like that. I'll have some of that. So we're like, oh yeah, that's why we did it. Yeah, we thought you'd break it. Close call. Close call. But by the time we got to New York, it was really hard to have an interview about the music because it would take an off this idea that this multiracial, it was like a we were some traveling sociology class with a, a soundtrack that you could play whilst it was discussed, which we didn't mind because it was a decent thing to discuss. But we sometimes got a little bit frustrated that it started to uh, take over from talking about the music and the songs now your albums you know i just can't stop you know they were successful in the uk how is your life changing i i, I had talked to uh, gary newman was on last week and he said when you become younger and, and you're young and you get a hit in in england some people are just mean to you he said it was weird he goes people were like you know like they they were pissed off at you or something. How is it for you guys when you when you you're getting you're young, you're a newer band, and your albums are doing well. The first album and the second album do great. Yeah. How were how did the people around you react to you, and then how did the rest of England react to you? Well, probably slightly different. There was some jealousy or hatred that you'd had a hiss, especially with other musicians that you'd known who'd got great bands and had been working for ages <laughs> and, and hadn't. Uh, so there was some of that. Most of them uh, were nice to us. And because we shared the money around seven, eight, nine ways or whatever, um, none of us became particularly wealthy in that first period. So we weren't that much different from the fans, really. We're making about the same money as I was making on the construction site. And, uh, and that seemed fine. Uh, when we came to America, of course, having a hit in America means, you know, 40 or 50 times the amount of sales. And so... Money started to accrue more there then, I think. Uh, I remember one particular time when tenderness was brought out the general public and it got added to a key station in Boston, an FM station. That, that was a sign. It was looking like it was going to be a hit. And in that uh, next two weeks, we were selling as many records a day as we'd sold in the two-week period before. It, it was ridiculous. Uh, well, I suppose it's five or six times a bigger place, so if you have a, a, a similar size hit, you're likely to sell five or six times more records. So that, that was a bigger difference, I think. Uh, in England, we didn't move to London or anything. We still lived in Hansworth, and we could still walk about and 
nobody really bothered us, or if they bothered us, they were nice about it. There was a small change in my local bar where Saxa drank as well in Hansworth, the, the Crom- Crompton Arms. Uh, they came back from that first tour in America uh, with the Pretenders. And I walked in. It was a lunchtime, luckily. I walked in and the owner said, oh, hello, Elvis, you're around. And he made me buy everybody in the bar a drink. <laughs> luckily, there was only about nine or ten people in there. I was glad I hadn't gone in the night. <laughs> Now, so now, that was his, that was Elvis for a bit at the pub. Now, as you, you guys were, you guys were also a very a socially conscious band. Where did yeah. that come from? Was that because of the reason you were mixed, or was that because you're black and white and you probably, you know, people weren't used to it? Or, I mean, what made you guys all become very socially conscious? And you were at a young age, too. Well, you know, Margaret Thatcher did a bit to help with that. <laughs> um, something to push against. It wasn't that uncommon in our circles. Punk had been quite political and had a lot to say. But it was screaming. It was angry. And it was it sounded too much like the people they were opposing. So our sense of it was there was no point trying to save a planet unless it was fun. And so you should be able to find a way to discuss these issues, but with a, an upbeat optimistic sounding music track would give you the chance of getting away with saying a few more heavy things and in some ways we were trying to be subversive with that Uh, the idea was to be the monkeys with John Lennon writing the lyrics behind the screens we're too busy singing to sing stand down Margaret about the Prime Minister (laughs) on television (laughs) <laughs> so I mean and that was all well and good it was more like a social program with music <laughs> using music to try and say things but it wasn't anything that special it was only really what everybody was talking about in pubs and bus stops it was just when it came to pop music you were somehow not meant to sing about what everybody was talking about it was odd and I honestly thought at the time in the early 80s if you had a, an LP with 10 or 12 songs on it and you didn't mention politics once, that was a far more political statement than having a few lines in a song about what somebody said in a pub. A lot more political. How could they ignore it so blasé <laughs> Now, you know, you said the first tour in America was with the Pretenders. And now, when you came back, how often were you coming back to America at that time? You would get done your tour, you would go back to Birmingham, then you'd go to back to America. I mean, who were some of the other bands that you were opening for? Uh, we soon got uh, opening slots with the police on those uh, police picnics, you know, uh, and with the bands associated with them, so like Wall of Voodoo. Um, we got to open for the Talking Heads, on the remaining light tour and we got to open for the clash on combat rock tour and on a tour in europe uh in many ways we went we became the go-to opening band and they all said the same thing uh that even david bowie said from the he said from the moment i went on stage last night the crowd was like straight up straight up no he said that you did that you did that and uh, he wanted us to go on tour with him in America. We were a little bit chastened, though, because we we did that Pretenders tour, and there was bedlam. (laughs) That's the only word for it. There was bedlam. Uh, Sire had put it together, and so we got to stay in the same hotel. But there was quite often police in the lobby. When we (laughs) checked out, and you go and look, and there was smashed up hotel rooms, and yellow incident tape across things and bathrooms smashed up, TVs out of windows and stuff, and uh, and quite a lot of drinking. Like drinking competitions, we couldn't keep up. Couldn't keep up. But six weeks after the end of the tour, half the pretenders were dead. The best two at the bar, <laughs> the popes of the tap room, who we thought were 
older, wiser, mature. They were 27. (laughs) We were 23, so they looked like grown-ups to us. Had to shave every day, some of them. (laughs) So that did make us think about it a little bit. It did make us think about it a little bit. Be careful. And uh, luckily, we didn't lose anybody uh, on the road. Uh, and then we um, tried to think who else we opened up for a tour. REM opened up for us for a tour, which was fabulous. And when the talk, when we opened up for the Talking Heads, David Byrne came backstage after our sound check and asked us the same questions each time: Did we need anything? Was sound check okay? And was anybody being an asshole to us? <laughs> Every day, every day. What a lovely man. What a lovely man. And uh, so the next tour we were doing, we'd got this young, nervous band from Athens, Georgia, called R.E.M. And I was so impressed by David Byrne's treatment of us, I started to do the same with R.E.M. So I go to the dressing room, was your sound check okay? Do you need anything? Is anybody being an asshole to you? Well, I got to speak to Mike Mills about five years ago, and we discussed that. And he said, do you know what? He said, I didn't know it had come from David Byrne. He said, we thought it was you. So we did it for the next 10 years with our opening bands. He said, I think you two started doing it too. (laughs) (laughs) So that was nice, wasn't it? Now, now what was the Us Festival like? I've heard, you know, it was, if people, if you don't know, the Us Festival was this huge huge uh, concert in San Bernardino, actually. And uh, what was that like for you guys? I mean, the crowds were giant. I heard it was very hot. What was it like? And were you guys surprised when they asked you to be on it? I was. um, But we'd done some shows with the police and it had gone down well. And they were on that one. So I think we got in on that. And then the next year we got asked again because The Clash were on and we were on tour with The Clash. Uh, so only us and Oingo Boingo got to do both of them. Uh, the first one, I thought I was ready for it, to be honest, until I found out it was going to be my first go in a helicopter because they couldn't drive you in and out. There was like a quarter of a million people in this dust bowl. No way in and out at the time, so you had to use a helicopter. And I'd never been in one. And it scared me a bit because I, I knew they went up, but I didn't know the wind blew them 20 feet either side. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I was quite glad I survived that and was relaxed and relieved to get on stage. Just I was just nervous about the helicopter ride back home. And uh, the second one was a bit more dramatic because the Clash had called a press conference and were saying that the old wave bands were getting paid way more money than they were. And it wasn't fair. And uh, they actually got their money doubled. Didn't get us a raise at the time. But um, but it was a bit odd. And then it was time for their show. And because of the controversy, the show started late. And not the organisers, but the union guys on the stage were looking for revenge. So three songs before the end of the set, they cut the power on the clash. And... Uh, we were on the side of the stage. I was only about two feet away from Mick Jones because I used to like to watch him the best. And we were good mates at the time. And uh, most of our road crew and most of our band were on stage watching too. So the power got shut off and it was like um, West Side Story. When you're a jet, you're a jet. For, so the two sides lined up on stage and the American Union crew were ready to bust some acts. <laughs> and the Clash's road crew were like, you better switch the juice back on, pal, else we'll fuck you up. <laughs> and it went on and it went on and it went on. And we were standing there, part of it too, with our sleeves rolled up and our collars up, being part of the Clash generation. And they got to play three extra songs. So it was a all very punky revolution. But afterwards, I felt a bit like... <laughs> It's a bit more exciting than the music. Although they did play a spirited set. Now, you called it quits after three albums. Was yes. It, was that, I read somewhere where you said there's only 
every band only has three good albums in them. I don't know if well, that's true. No, me and Andy thought that before we started a group. And from our own record collection, we started to feel it that sometimes by a fourth album, the band had settled into a corporate way of communicating to their sales base. And I remember a particular time it happened with Van Morrison, Bob Dylan and Bob Marley that their live albums were more exciting than their latest release, which is rare, really. But it was just a sign. So we promised each other if it got stale, if it ever felt like that, we'd, we'd have the courage to knock it on the head. We didn't quite work out that way. But there was a definite slowing down and a lack of enthusiasm into the fourth year. <clears throat> and some people wanted two years off with quotes like, there's more planes than buses nowadays. Or, I just want to go to the shops, buy some shopping, come back and cook it. That's all I want to do today. And so we had the idea of a deal from Virgin Records and we'd been at it about six months and every time we thought we were close, some of the chaps who wanted some time off came up with another six things to <laughs> negotiate or argue out. And I got called down to Virgin Records and the guy told me, he said, it's obvious that the beat's finished. He said, you don't want this record deal. Some people are finding ways to not do this record deal. And from everything we're hearing, half the band don't want to do anything for the next two years. So would you like a record deal with anybody else out of the group that you think would be worth doing a deal, uh, making a record with? So I suggested David Steele, because I thought he, he was, well, he's the genius of the band, isn't he? You know, the mirror in the bathroom, right? I still haven't heard a bass line like it. I said, he's the genius of the group, but they were all like, oh, no, 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 he's too hard to work with. <laughs> he was one of the guys that wanted the two years up. So they said, what about Roger? I mean, you and Roger still seem to have some juice together. You look good together. You're both still writing songs. He's keen to keep working. So are you. Would you like to do something like that? And me and Roger had just had our first babies. Well, we'd had our girlfriends to have them for us, but we'd just both become fathers. And... Uh, because the money had been shared equally out between all the band members, nobody really had the money for two years off to take care of a kid. So um, I had the song Tenderness. Uh, it had been impossible to get a rehearsal together <laughs> with the beat. It had just been impossible. We'd never managed to play the song. We'd had a couple of rehearsals, but usually somebody would show up a couple of hours late because they'd had to see their accountants. And then somebody had to leave in half an hour anyway because they'd got a new cooker being delivered and they had to be there to let the gas man in. And and so and I had this song, Tenderness, and uh, played it to the people at Virgin, just on the acoustic guitar, and they said, let's go, let's go. Uh, and so, so that was sort of how it came and went, really. But, so we did do three albums, but it... It wasn't so much deciding that it had run its course and that it would be going through the motions afterwards. We just ran out of steam, basically. Now, General Public, how did, who came up with the name General Public? Well, I did. Uh, it was 1984 just coming up, and I noticed that politicians particularly when they were stretching a point or lying, would say, the general public have made it quite clear. Of course, they'd done no such thing. But their name was used a lot. And then I thought, with Big Brother imagery coming up soon, what about if general public was a person as well, like Big Brother's eyes? So it was meant to be both sides of the boot at the end of... Um, Brave New World was a boot stamping continually on a face. So it's the face looking up at the boot and it was the face looking 
looking down from the boot. It was the it was the general idea. Now that tenderness, you know, became a big hit. How do you think the video affected that? Because once again, it was uh, videos were so important back then. I mean, then the video is it's a good video, and you have the kids in the beginning, and then everyone remembers the clapping. I mean, that's just something you always. It's like there's some songs when you drive, you know, you're driving, you hear it's that, and Steve Miller took yeah. the money and run. You go, yeah. I got to clap. You know, then you I got to shoot my hands in the wheel. But um, what was it like for you shooting that video? Did you? I mean, you had shot videos before, but this was more you were. You were the main, I mean, Roger was there, but what was that like for you? And well, it, it was a reaction to a previous video that had been made in England that had horrified IRS records. They thought it would not only destroy the song, it would destroy the band. It was that bad. <laughs> and it had been made by Nicholas Rowe, directed by his son, who was just starting. And uh, it was set in a swimming pool, mainly. And it was uh, me falling in love with a female bodybuilder who was a lifeguard. He just made the runaway, runaway, Bronsky beat video about the lad running away from being beat up for his dad for being gay. So I like that video. So I said, oh, he said, well, I'll do it. He said, but I make the story. So I was like, okay. And, and that was the story. And he ended up in the showers in the swimming pool and I'm cornered by this big feminine female bodybuilder who then rips off her wig and has got a crew cut and just <laughs> collapses me into the corner. Miles Copeland could not believe it. but <laughs> And so uh, C.D. Taylor, who we'd worked with before and who I liked very much, it was brought in and they said, we'll make a video. We're going to make an American video. That won't work. We... They said, we can't get that played. We can't get that on MTV with Aston. We can't get it on. So you've got one video that covers that side of it. Now let's make a video that covers the other side of it. <laughs> and so the kids were brought in and uh, they had some special eye drops. I don't know what they were, that they put in my eyes. And it made them look really blue. And uh, I wasn't particularly thrilled with the video to start with because I was comparing it to the other one. And so it felt like, no, oh, really? Uh, so it looks nice. But my mom said, oh, ah, David, your eyes look the prettiest in that video that I've ever seen them. So I was like, well, that's, that'll do that. We'll take that as a win. <laughs> now, now, after that video, did, did more people start recognizing you? Because videos, everyone watched videos. I mean, did you start getting recognized more? I suppose so, a little bit. I can, uh, the year before, 18 months before, because that was, that got a lot of play on MTV. So that started to, uh, start to happen a little bit more, which I enjoyed at the time. It was never that much that you'd got to run or anything. Um, nowadays, it doesn't happen enough, frankly. But every now and then, I'll go to a supermarket and somebody will say, excuse me, Mr. Wakeling. <laughs> which I always used to think was my dad's name, not mine. But um, And they're all very, I'm sorry to bother you while you're shopping. But can I just tell you? <laughs> which is lovely. Uh, but we never really got to uh, the mass mobbing thing. Sometimes at shows, you'd have to have security to get you in and out. But not really so much walking in the streets. There were still plenty of other people more... Uh, obvious and more famous. Now, what happened to the general public? Did you just run your course, or what, what happened there? Um, we would uh, present songs and demos to the record company, and they tended to pick more of mine than Rogers, which upset him. And they would pick some of Rogers, but they'd say, but you're going to have to work on the lyrics. And um, Roger was more interested in the music, and he would sometimes just put words in there to give an idea of how the melodies were meant to go. And sometimes they wouldn't really change much from that. So they sounded nice, and the words sounded evocative. But if you read them, it wasn't actually about something specific. It was more like a wordscape 
could you call it? So I would work with him on the songs, and then we'd represent them, and they'd go, oh, yeah, that's smashing, like that one. And there was a few of them. And I wouldn't really change his songs. I'd just go through his lyrics and say, well, that's your best bits, isn't it? That's your hook line there. That's the, the line I keep coming back to. His songs tended to be titled whatever the first line of his poem was. It didn't have a title. So there was nothing it went back to as the chorus. Nothing that repeated ever in the song. So we kind of did that with them. But it, Roger still didn't like it, so then he wanted to make solo records all the time. But also wanted to be in general public. So I said, well, how's that going to work? I said, I'll tell you what, I said, if I've got six songs started now that I think are worth putting on a record, I said, if I'm making a general public record and I'm making a Dave Wakeling record, I'm putting them best six songs on the Dave Wakeling record, aren't I? I said, and, and you do the same. I said, so you put your six best songs to your solo record and then what, I'm allowed to share the next best six so I don't, that doesn't sound like hits, does it, you know? And no, 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 I'll make sure I put some other good ones to general public. <laughs> That's pretty big of you. And then we were in Boston. Again, funny enough, we're attending us and started it all off. Landing in an airport, uh, at the airport for um, promotional to radio stations. And just as we was landing, he said, I still want to make that solo record, you know? <laughs> And I was like, I didn't really want to be on a free promotional tour for two weeks, flying to the city every day. And, and I definitely didn't need to hear that just as we were landing. So I said, yes, you should. Really? I said, yes, because I'm going to. No, 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 no. I don't want to split the group. I said, you just have, not you? You just have. So after that happens, where what direction do you go into? Because, you know, you've... You've had a lot of success and popularity, you know, with not a lot of albums, but you guys have hit it. You hit it young. What what would what did you look to your what was your future gonna be? Were you were you confused or what did you want to do? Um, not really. I'd got some songs, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I was excited about the opportunity to try and work with different people, or perhaps some of the people I'd already worked with and try songs in different ways and be able to have a bit more control over it. It didn't work out very well. I was flattered that Miles Copeland told me that I should do the same as Sting on that Blue Turtles record. He said he surrounded himself as than him and forced himself to reach up to their level. I said, I said, that sounds great. I'd love to do that. He said, but you've got to come to Los Angeles to do it so and keep an eye on you. I said, okay, that's fine. And it started off really great, really great. Um, what do you want to tell? Put together a band. Uh, great, amazing players on it. Amazing production would be on it. The budget, which was kind of high. And... I took it back, and uh, IRS had just made this film called um, Heavy Metal Years Part 9 or something. Didn't do very well, I don't think, but they'd spent a fortune on it. They'd spent all their money on it, it turned out, and it hadn't worked out. So I took the budget in, and they said, OK, we'll get back to you. I went back in the office, and they said, go back and ask them if they'll do it for half. I said, really? I said, isn't that your job? You're the record company. To them. No, no, it come better from you. So I asked them, and they weren't thrilled because they were all world-class players, a world-class studio. And um, they said, well, if we do some of it in the small room and we do some of it with keyboard programming, uh, yes, we can do it. So I was like, oh, okay. We didn't seem to lose much quality. We didn't lose any players. And we didn't lose any studio uh, quality either. So I was thrilled and went back. And they said, see if they'll do it for half. I said, I, I, don't, I don't even go and ask. That's less than you'd make an album with P. 
people that you don't know in the studio you've never heard of. I said, you can't ask these people <laughs> to work at the complex to, to work for such low money. We'll go and ask him anyway. And I explained my embarrassment and they said, no, we're really sorry. We can't do it for half of that again. So just to put it in perspective, we've got the Doobie Brothers would like to give us $300,000 to come in and see if we can help them write some songs for a new album. <laughs> so <laughs> compared to that, we won't be doing your project. So I was upset. I was really disappointed because that's what Miles had said. So you surround yourself with better players than you think you are, and it'll drag you up. And uh, we'd had a little play out, so I thought it sounded great. Anyway, it was off. And then another chap who worked all on the computers went on to do the next great XTC album. What's his name? It might come to me. But I got to meet with him. He was excited. I wasn't so thrilled about the machines, but he seemed to have a handle on them that he could make them move. He could make prints of where the speed should speed up and slow down. It wasn't going to be just like a metronome. So I was like, well, that'd be worth having a go at. And I liked him very much and his ideas. And the LP he made straight afterwards with XTC did come out great. I liked it. And so he gave me a budget, which was similar to somewhere between the second and third budget from the complex. And I went there. Guess what they asked me to ask him? Cut it in half. Yeah, see if you'll do it for half. Yeah, he didn't take so long to say no. He said, I'm doing the XTC <laughs> <laughs> So then it just collapsed at that point, really. And I, I got left with um, a chap that I'd written songs with, a good songwriter who'd written... One of the co-writers for Automatic. It's totally automatic, whatever you're around. And I liked him much, and we wrote a couple of decent songs. And he was kind of just learning the programming above a demo level. And so we tried, and we tried, and he had people in, and it always sounded like square. It never sounded round. And it was really hard to sing to. It was like the words didn't fit because everything was square and there was no legato at all. And I sing off the back of the beat because of my dad telling me about Frank Sinatra. And I couldn't make the words fit, so I, I, I gave up. I gave up. I said, it, it don't work. I said, you brought me all this way. You promised me the earth and you'll give me dirt. And I went home. I went back to England. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, who knows, um, Miles Copeland had done a deal with a record label where he was obliged to to give them so many albums per quarter, otherwise he lost money on the deal. So he had to supply a certain amount of product, and he was short of product for the quarter, so he gave two guys who owed him money from another band to finish off my record and they brought it out. <laughs> and I had a song on it called No Warning and Miles thought it'd be very funny to call the album No Warning because they didn't give me any either. And uh, so I got one of the biggest litigators in New York and they said, yeah, you know, you might have a chance to start. He's crossed a lot of different lines here and different people playing on it and We've had a look at the contract here. Yeah, he's pushed his luck a bit. You know, there might be some luck here. He said, the question to you is, how would you like to take on a multi-millionaire megalomaniac in a New York court for the next two years? Or would you like to put your head under a rock for the next three months and we'll get you off IRS? And I said, pass the rock. <laughs> <laughs> Which at the time seemed the sensible thing. We'd heard all stories about Miles Copeland trying to prevent other people from leaving even when he knew he didn't have a case and he'd take them to court just to make them spend a couple hundred thousand dollars and freak them out and he'd lose the case anyway he just wanted to put them through hell so it didn't seem like a fight worth taking at the time and 
But I didn't realise that he would... What do they call this? Something blues band. They'd been a sort of English prog rock band in the 60s, I think. 60s and early 70s. What do they call it? Anyway. Uh, and so that didn't work out very well for me. And um, I decided that it was time to take a break from music business and look at something else that I'd wanted to do, which was work for Greenpeace. And I'd done a few things with a beat and then a bit more with general public, Greenpeace benefits or, you know, and I'd met the Greenpeace people and I spent a day doing interviews with Suzanne Vega and the head of Greenpeace's uh, media. And he said, if you ever want to do something for us or with us, he said, you know, give me a call. He said, you've got both sides of it. You've got the entertainment side and you've got the green side and you can speak about both comfortably. He said, that's not very many can. So if you'd ever fancy doing something. And it was odd because I phoned up and said, I was taking a break from the music. I didn't give him all the reasons. And um, he'd said to me, if I ever fancied doing something to give him a ring, so I was giving him a call. And he said, well, how odd is that? He said, it, it was a Tuesday. He said, I only got back in the office after two years yesterday, Dave. He said, I've been working for the Christic Institute in the Oliver North case. Um, he said, so I've just started back again and my desk's full. He said, but I have already noticed that there's an album that came out in Europe from Greenpeace and they're just about to try and re release it in America. He said, but the problem is, he said, the office is going to be in Los Angeles. I said, that's where I live. He said, do you live anywhere near La Brea and Sunset? And I said, yes, just down the road the other side of the a and lost. He said, could you be at this address at two o'clock? Yes. And I went and I got the job. And so then I worked for four years for Greenpeace uh, mainly Greenpeace International, sometimes Greenpeace USA, um, on special projects, basically entertainment, or often entertainment-based projects. We made a, a solar power al album called, live solar power album called Alternative Energy with U2 and REM and Annie Lennox. And I managed to use some of my old contacts to, to be able to convince people to do it. Um, because I knew what it was like to be invited and deserted into a dreadful charity event. <laughs> you wish you'd never been born, you know? Um, so I was able to tell them, I, I know what it feels like, and I promise you, if it looks anything like that, you'll be made a mug of. I'll warn you before you know, and I'll get you out of this. And, and people signed up quite happily on the basis of that. And we got labels and publishers to waive their royalties on stuff. And we got a record club to do it for free and made it the record of Christmas month, you know. And so it made a few million dollars for Greenpeace uh, because of the way we went about it. And um, I think there was some charitable C3 status stuff done so that people could donate stuff and write it off on their taxes, you know. So it, it seemed to work for everybody involved. And then we would do things like TV shows would ask us for posters or music or various stuff. And then as a liaison with celebrities and Greenpeace campaign directors, because um, quite often we'd have... Um, various celebrities come up and say a few words and it would be quite different from uh, what Greenpeace's position on something was. <laughs> For example, taking Chrissy Hine to Moscow, where she announced she thought the best thing anybody could do to the environment was to blow up the nearest McDonald's, which was quite funny, and it might not have been that bad for the planet, but it wasn't particularly Greenpeace's. <laughs> <laughs> platform when we were trying to start an office in Moscow. So uh, I lined up the different campaign directors with the celebrities and I got them involved on the daily updates and briefings and got them 
if they wanted to, to sit in on the phone conference calls of the, the campaign that they liked. Or if a celebrity wanted to do something, you'd ask them, well, what are you interested? Do you like water? Do you like toxics? Do you like animals? What do you like? You know, because that's where you're going to have the most fun. And they'd find something that they thought was an interesting issue, and then I'd turn them on to the campaign directors, and they'd feel really invested because they're now getting daily Greenpeace updates on their campaign, which was great. It worked out tremendously well because if they ever got caught by surprise at that interview and asked about it, or if they ever saw an opportunity in interview, they'd got today's stuff exactly how Greenpeace would say it, and they could put it into their words. It would have a really great impact, but it would be correct in the politically correct as well. You know, So yeah. that worked quite well. Now I got to ask you. You're, you're going to go back. We talked about you going back on tour. You, you started going back on tour again. What do what do you get the most out of it? Does it does it amaze you that there's crowds where there's there's kids, there's kids and their parents, and yes. it's like what what do you play? I mean, are you, are you mix up? How do you how will you set your set list for this tour? Is do you have an encore already picked out? I never play an encore. I haven't played an encore in years. I Why not? Think, I think they're an affectation. I just play three extra songs. You know, you just play 90 minutes and then the 15 extra minutes, and that's the encore. The thing that I hate the mo- most about it, and I used to hate it when I was a kid, although I was glad they'd come back on, was it always seemed so stupid to me that the amplifiers were left on and everybody does this false theatrical run off the stage. And then they do the same false theatrical run back on the stage and act really surprised. Oh, my God. Thank you. Oh, oh, that's so incredible. It's like you've got the encore written down. The people are looking over the speaker. They already know what three songs and all this pretense. So I've, I've just always hated it. And I tell the crowd that. And now my crowd knows that. So we're not going through with any nonsense about an encore. We'll just play an extra 20 minutes. Not doing the little running off bit and running off. No, maybe, maybe I will. But there could be some use for an encore. Uh, there's a song "Never Die" on my last album, which was about grief and loss. It was really about reflections about my parents and losing my parents. But uh, it sounds like a song about COVID. And. Uh, I might do that in the set. And it had occurred to me, like, where would you put it in the set? There isn't anywhere <laughs> without it, like, <sighs> and you'd have to build everything back, dry your eyes, come on, come on. Um, and so I might come on and do it as an encore. I might, I'm not sure. It would work as an encore because you st- you've got a standing start and it would have a huge impact and then perhaps follow it with Save It for Later that's in the same tuning. So I might try something like that. We don't usually have a set list. I just call them. Okay. Although we usually start with Rough Rider because it's six minutes long. It's easy to play. And it gives everybody a chance to get their sound and balance right and the guy out front to get it figured out before we have to do anything else. So whether it will be that song but usually it's the same song to start with and everybody knows that and we work towards getting our chops together during that song so at the beginning of the second song there's no technical issues everybody can hear everybody else and we're ready to just go for it so there'll probably be some of that I might put some different songs in as well some songs off WAP and second beat record like I'm Your Flag and um, yes uh, maybe get a job even there's, there's a few songs uh, yeah, I'd like to think of myself as Scostradamus frankly but it's, it's a bit sad in a way that things that you would sing about that <coughs> were abhorrent or needed change 40 years ago and it's the same bloody subject I'm your flag, for example. It's even the same. But the countries, Iran into Northern Ireland, 
ran into Afghanistan dying to become a man. And it's like the 40th anniversary of that album last week or two weeks ago. And the Iran's still seething. There was buses being burnt in the streets of Belfast. And we were just withdrawing from Afghanistan. And all the calamities between them started up again. So that's kind of odd. I mean, you feel nice. Well, you called that one, Dave. And some of the fans say that as well. Cool. These songs are just as current as they were. How did you do that? Uh, but it's sad in a way that it is cur- still current. It, it, it is, it's a shame, I think. Um, especially our new flag people wrapping themselves in flags nowadays, jingoism, uh, nationalism, pretending to be patriotism. Whereas the people wrapped in the flags actually hate half the people in the country they're in. But they've wrapped the flag around. They don't even like their own country. Never mind about any others. So I hate all that. And I might put that song in the set. I haven't done it in a while. But there's a few songs. We might change around a little bit. Um, a new a song off the last album... Uh, I just posted it on Facebook as well. If Killing Worked, it would have worked by now. Uh, and that's pretty current. So I might put that, people are asking me if I would put that one in the set. So I, I might well do. Turn on your TV, see what we've done. We've made our culture look like a setting sun. But we're better than that because we know how. If Killing Worked, it would have worked by now. Well, that's perfect, man. You know, I hope you can go to England. Now, I know you have some California dates set. Are you going to tour in the U.S.? If, you know, are you? Yes, gonna... yes. we've got um, some dates set for October and November with the Fix, the national tour. Um, we've got our own dates, as you say, in California in April, going through into September. We've got punk rock bowling in Las Vegas in September too, and. Quite a lot of other exciting plans. The only other one confirmed is May of 22, and we'll be opening for Madness um, in Berkeley, Los Angeles, New York, and Boston. So well, that's that awesome. I, I want to thank you for taking the time today. You guys better play in Philly because I'm going to come see you guys. Oh, we will. We will. We, we like playing in Philly. I played the World Cafe quite a lot. I like that place. You know, it's got nice sound, but it's a little bit antiseptic, isn't it? It's a bit like going to an exhibition. Well, there's there's the upstairs and there's the downstairs. Yeah. I've been to shows at both. I saw Richard Barone upstairs, where you're uh-huh. sitting at the bar and it's tables. And then downstairs, there's the tables, there's the big dance, like the big floor. Yeah. And um, it, it's it's good, but it's you feel... You don't feel like you're going into a con. You feel like you're going into an office building. You don't feel like you're going into yes. a office because when you walk in, yeah, I know what you're saying. I'm not. I'm not saying that I like dirty places painted matte black, the smell of <laughs> urine and old beer. But they could have just a little scratch and sniff on your tickets just to get in touch. Up, you know? just a little touch. But I do like it there, and I like the people very much there, and I love playing Philly because it reminds me of Birmingham. You know, everybody feels this urgent need to be frank with you whether you expected it or not can I tell you something it looks like you're going to <laughs> well I, I want to thank you Dave now you're on Twitter a lot what's your Twitter oh just Dave Wakeling and um, there's an English beat page as well uh, but I don't run that um, I, I really only use the Facebook page for the English beat um, and I post every day on that and get a few thousand likes most often it's built up over during the pandemic and i we've talked about the pandemic a lot our feelings about it and safety and sometimes it's got a bit nasty but i get to hide those messages (laughs) and uh, it's been really useful it's been really good so if anybody it's becoming a bit of a community. Every Sunday, Sunday we have a um, gardening Sunday. It's from the the Wakeling Rose Gardens. So I, I post pictures of the garden, and everybody else posts what their flowers are doing that Sunday. Indeed. It's really, really quite good fun. 
it's a change from music. It's a change from war in the Middle East, and it's a change from the pandemic. You know? So people go check out the English beat. Check out Dave Wakeling. Follow him on Twitter. Go to the Facebook page. Go see him in concert. They're they're a great band. Um, go to my website, uh, CooperTalk.net. You can find over 850 episodes up there. You can email me, Cooper, at CooperTalk.net. Uh, Twitter, I'm at CooperTalk. Instagram, I'm at CooperTalk1. And remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guests. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time.